People's Platform. Good evening and welcome to the People's Platform. One of the stipulations under the IMF Governance Diagnostic Report was to enact legislation uh, on proceeds of crime. Um, this is pertaining to recovery of stolen assets. Now, the Ministry of Justice has come up with a draft which is still not in the public domain. Um, this discussion tonight will focus on the varying implications of uh, the proposed legislation, what factors need to be uh, taken into account when preparing such legislation, and of the importance of public consultation uh, in this regard. Just to give you a brief, um, I'll read an excerpt from a TISL report on the topic. Recovery of stolen assets is a process that ensures that assets which are lost to a country as a result of crimes are seized, confiscated, returned to the country of origin and restored to their rightful owners. This is a complicated process that requires the coordinated efforts of law enforcement agencies of multiple countries identified as origin, transit and destination countries. Countries. The two main principles that form the basis of this process is that crime should not pay and that the benefit of these stolen assets must ultimately uh, compensate and benefit the rightful owners of it, the direct victims and the secondary victims of the crime, that is society from which the assets have been taken away. Sri Lanka currently lacks a comprehensive framework that governs the recovery of stolen assets. So let's get into the discussion. My guest tonight is Sulakshi Madhavala joining us for the first time on the show. She's a senior program officer of the political section at TISL, Transparency International Sri Lanka. Good evening and welcome to the show, Sulakshi. Good evening, Sonali. Uh, Sulakshi, my first question to you is... Um, how is corruption impacting Sri Lanka's uh, governance and civic space today? Uh, first of all, uh, Sonal, I'd like to start by saying uh, Sri Lanka is a country with systemic corruption, which has uh, brought the country to its knees and has uh, led to governance and economic crisis. And and the, if you ask why it has led to an economic crisis, because there has been abuse of public resources and, uh, there ha and there has been public funds that have siphoned from the outside the country. And uh, because of this, uh, there has, uh, it has created, uh, during the Aragalia time, the people were demanding for a system change in the country. And uh, then that means they are asking for good governance and an end to, end to corruption. And uh, because of this, and if you take uh, the, when the economic collapsed in 2022, uh, one of the things uh, that uh, the people of the country have been asking is to rec recover stolen assets. It was a slogan during mm -hmm. the Aragale time. And, uh, and to bring this, uh, and instead of bringing, uh, instead of working on recovering stolen assets, instead of uh, implementing, uh, enacting a law and implementing it, we haven't seen much progress in terms of economic recovery or uh, in terms of uh, system change. But what we have seen is a deeply concerning uh, state of uh, civic space and public participation uh, because there have been uh, laws that are being brought by uh, the government, uh, such as the Online Safety Act and the proposed anti-terrorism bill. Uh, which can uh, violate the fundamental rights of the citizens, their democratic principles, and, uh, to, and it might uh, stifle dissent and uh, suppress civic activism. Uh, so uh, because of this, we, uh, there, sh there should be, uh, uh, the, go the government should uh, try to, uh, like, not bring anti-democratic laws, but to try to uh, get citizens, give opportunities for citizens to engage in policy processes, uh, give them the freedom to express uh, when they see something wrong, there's something wrong in the country. Because uh, otherwise people will lose the freedom to speak up and to uh, take part in how their country is run. Because uh, when the, because uh, if these laws are being brought, then when, if the, uh, the basic idea of democracy, uh, the principle of democracy is, uh, 
uh, is uh, violated, then uh, the citizens won't have the freedom to uh, participate. So uh, that is the current uh, status of civic space, uh, which what we see in Sri Lanka right now. How significant uh, is the public demand for recovery of stolen assets? Um, talk to us about the challenges that Sri Lanka faces. Uh, in my introduction, I said that the government is coming up with a, a mandated uh, Proceeds of Crime uh, Act. Yes, uh, so when you um, say stolen asset recovery, it's a very uh, time-consuming, complex process, right? Uh, if you look at international cases where they have successfully returned uh, stolen assets to their countries, it has taken about a decade. Right. And if you look at uh, how long it takes, like how many years it takes in Sri Lanka for a criminal case to conclude, it takes about 10.2 years. Uh, which is a long time, so that is uh, what uh, we should, ex what what people should be expecting, because it's not a like a quick, like you don't get the assets recovered the next day. It's not a process like that. But however, uh, to uh, now in Sri Lanka, we do currently do have laws uh, to recover assets that are within the country, such as the Prevention of Money Laundering Act or the uh, Custom Ordinance or Criminal Procedure Code. And a few other laws are already in place. But in order to recover assets that are located outside the country, uh, uh, which are uh, hidden uh, in another country, we need a comprehensive law such as the Proceeds of Crime Act. Mm. Uh, with, because without that, it's difficult, the, the, it's difficult to have mutual cooperation with international cooperation. And uh, because uh, some of this money, uh, when individuals uh, send this money uh, through different banks in different countries, it travels to through multiple jurisdictions, which means you are dealing with uh, multiple laws and regulations. Mm. So in order to uh, successfully have international collaboration with these countries to get their support uh, to bring back the assets back to Sri Lanka, uh, we need to have a law. And also, in addition to that, a law is not just sufficient, but also we need to have a mechanism to manage the assets. So once you locate these assets, mm. uh, there should be a way to manage the assets without uh, creating uh, circumstances to, to uh, depreciate the asset value. And once the assets, uh, when once you have a mechanism, you also need to have a mechanism to distribute these assets to, the, uh, to their rightful owners, which means the victims of corruption, right? So all these uh, things need to be in place to successfully get the, uh, to recover stolen assets. So these are some of the uh, challenges we are facing because uh, right now Sri Lanka uh, doesn't uh, have the expertise uh, to, you know, identify trace assets and to uh, seize them. And that knowledge and expertise also has to be built and they need to, uh, and there are also initiatives like international initiatives that support countries like developing countries like Sri Lanka uh, to recover these assets. They uh, foster uh, international collaborations and uh, uh, say recovery efforts of these countries. So Sri Lanka needs to start engaging with these initiatives to make it work. So Lakshmi, take us through some of the successful asset recovery initiatives uh, from across the world. Yes, two main initiatives. There are several, like lots of initiatives. I'll touch on two of those. Uh, one is called the uh, Stolen Asset Recovery Initiative. In short, it's called STAR. Uh, so, uh, during the Aragale time, um, there was uh, when people were very interested in the in on the subject, they were uh, t uh, talking about STAR, and there was this misconception that uh, STAR recover assets for Sri Lanka, which is actually disinformation and misinformation. Uh, what STAR does is it's not an organization, it's an initiative, uh, a partnership, uh, with, uh, initiative created through a partnership between the World Bank and uh, the United Nations uh, Office on Drugs and Crimes. Um, so what this initiative does is they uh, support uh, countries uh, to prevent uh, pr uh, the, laun the laundering of proceeds of crime and to uh, and to bring back assets in a timely manner. So they will give you the knowledge, the expertise, the resources, but they won't be uh, bringing back the stolen assets 
to uh, Sri Lanka, like they won't do it on behalf of you, but they will give you the support needed. And um, the other initiative is called uh, GFA, it's a global forum on asset recovery. Uh, so what GFA does is um, they help with the uh, international collaborations. So when this, uh, this is a platform which was uh, organized by the STAR initiative uh, and it was co-hosted by United States and the United Kingdom. And when this uh, GFA Im initiative emerged, they uh, picked a few countries uh, and uh, four countries among that uh, was Sri Lanka and the other three countries are Nigeria, Tunisia and Ukraine. And um, that was a misconception there also because people thought the reason Sri Lanka was picked because it's one of the most corrupt countries in the world, but that's not the case. The reason the con uh, our country was picked because at the time uh, they saw a priority uh, jurisdiction in terms of uh, providing assistance to Sri Lanka to combat corruption and to recover stolen assets. So both these initiatives has actively been supporting countries like Nigeria. So uh, you may have heard of the General, uh, Sach, uh, General Sani Abach, uh, Abacha case. So he was the former president of uh, Nigeria who has lauded about from uh, between three to five uh, billion dollars uh, during his presidency. It's a five tenure presidency. And uh, following his death, uh, death uh, and they started investigations looking into his uh, illicit activities and then uh, also it created some changes in the legal system. Uh, the country enacted a law called Proceeds of Crime Act in 2022. And uh, not only, and they were able to, uh, through the act, they were able to uh, recover a significant portion of the money. And, uh, and they didn't wait till the law was uh, enacted. What they did was, even before the enactment of the law, they reached out to STAR. They used the help of STAR and GFA initiatives. And they recovered, um, I don't have the figure right now, but uh, as I remember, it's 25 million uh, dollars they were able to recover uh, through the help of uh, those uh, two initiatives and uh, that is that was a success story and um, uh, and they are still it doesn't end there they but they keep trying to recover more and more but you may not recover the entire portion of assets that were stolen but you can get a significant uh, amount of it recovered and um, another international case is um, this case in philippines uh, uh, it was uh, Ferdinando Marcos, uh, which was also a former president in that country. Even during his tenure, uh, he uh, looted about uh, close to $10 billion uh, during his presidency. And uh, what Philippines uh, government did was they reached out to a Swiss uh, bank, uh, which where uh, the, uh, President Marcos' uh, assets were uh, in, uh, assets were at and they through mutual uh, assistant collaboration uh, the bank uh, sent bank uh, uh, sent back uh, more than uh, 1 billion not more than 1 billion back to philippines at their national bank um, so these are some of success stories um, so even and through this uh, international uh, cases, even Sri Lanka can learn, they can learn from what are the challenges these uh, countries face, how can Sri Lanka avoid those challenges. So it's uh, really interesting because uh, uh, it's something that has worked internationally, so it can work here as well if we try. Sure. Uh, we're in conversation with Sulakshi Madhavala, Senior Program Officer TISL. We're going for a break. We'll be right back. People's Platform. TV One. TV for Life. Iran's President, Dr. Said Ibrahim Raizi, will arrive in Sri Lanka on Wednesday, confirms Foreign Minister. President meets Mahanayaka Terrors of the Malvatu and Askiri chapters. Ramayan Trail, a project to upgrade nine sites based on the Ramayana, launched. 
Veyangoda warehouse complex has only issued rice stocks deemed suitable for human consumption by the expert committee, says President's Office. Multiple investigations launched into the Fox Hill tragedy, eight-year-old among the dead. TV One, TV for Life. The People's Platform. Welcome back. Recovery of stolen assets, reality implications. This is the topic of discussion tonight. My guest is Sulakshi Madhavala, Senior Program Officer, Political Sector of TISL, Transparency International Sri Lanka. Uh, Sulakshi, um, let's talk about the current state of Sri Lanka's legislation relating to uh, recovery of stolen assets. Yes, Sonali. Um, so, as you mentioned at the beginning, uh, Sri Lanka is currently drafting a law on Proceeds of Crime Act, uh, which is not uh, available in the public domain. Um, so, this act, uh, this law is uh, expected to help uh, our country to deal with this big issue of corruption and uh, stolen asset, rec uh, asset recovery. Right. Uh, this law uh, aims to identify assets, uh, freeze them, and uh, seize these assets. Uh, and also, um, the it's very important that this law get enacted, and not only get enacted, but also be implemented. Mm -hmm. Right? Because in Sri Lanka, we have all the laws, uh, but they are not implemented. So it's important that it is uh, implemented, and this law uh, contains all the all the necessary uh, things that need to be there right because right now uh, even though the law is being drafted uh, we uh, like civil society organizations and the public haven't been invited to uh, give inputs for this law and there are, uh, still the government is uh, yet to begin public consultations i hope uh, and we are hoping that the government will open uh, the platform for public con consultations but uh, so far we haven't seen that so it is also kind of concerning because uh, this is a very uh, important law in a time where our economy has been uh, economic development has been hindered where uh, people have uh, uh, have created distrust in their government so it's important that uh, to create trust in, 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 within, in within among the general public and to have transparency about the uh, process it's important that the government open uh, the platform uh, for civil society organizations and the public to uh, give inputs on this because uh, and uh, like I uh, mentioned earlier also, currently Sri Lanka doesn't have uh, uh, expertise uh, on the subject and there are local experts, there can be local experts that can uh, give uh, meaningful, valuable input for the law. Uh, to address uh, cha potential challenges the country may face when they actually uh, implement this law to actually recover uh, assets that were stolen from Sri Lanka. So. Uh, that is the current uh, status of the uh, law, and um, it's uh, and uh, one thing I another thing I want to highlight is that the reason Sri Lanka is bringing this law now is because the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, uh, has told uh, the Sri Lankan government that this law has to be enacted by end of this month, uh, as per the stipulations under a structural benchmark. So uh, it, we are also concerned that because of this deadline, whether the law will be rushed, uh, whether it would be properly drafted, because if it's not, then uh, the law won't be efficient, right? Then you won't be able to efficiently recover assets if it's just uh, uh, being drafted for the sake of being drafted. So it's important uh, that uh, the government uh, get public consultations for this. Sure. Now, in Sri Lanka, uh, corruption is so deep-rooted. Um, 
bribery is is deep rooted within the psyche of uh, Sri Lankans. Um, how do we bring in this culture of transparency? Speak to us about the challenges that Sri Lanka uh, will face in enhancing its capacity for asset recovery. Sure. Um, so now, uh, if Sri Lanka is to uh, recover uh, assets, uh, one challenge. Uh, there are several challenges uh, which uh, I see. Uh, one is uh, the lack of coordination uh, between the authorities. Now, if, say for example, uh, the bribery commission. They work. They will uh, focus on the corruption aspect of the asset recovery, right? And then the CID will focus on the criminal aspect of it. And if these two organizations don't work together, if they uh, work in silos, then it won't be effective. Because uh, to effectively and successfully recover assets, the authorities have to work together. And this is something that should also be mentioned uh, should be addressed in the Proceeds of Crime Act as well. And the other challenge I see is uh, we need expertise. Because, uh, like I mentioned, Sri Lanka lack uh, experts uh, on the subject, and especially when it comes to forensic audits, asset tracing, you need experts. Because uh, to tracing assets uh, that have gone through multiple bank accounts, tracing that path is not it's not going to be easy it's a it's a difficult task so to do that you need the right experts to do that and uh, another challenge i see is uh, we need a mechanism to manage the assets the uh, sri lanka has to uh, decide which uh, government institution or which body will manage the assets who will uh, uh, distribute uh, uh, who will distribute the assets because uh, unless you uh, dis uh, decide that you, you need to have this mechanism because otherwise and also it's important for you to uh, make that process a transparent process and you should allow even civil society organizations to monitor that because then it not it will also create public trust knowing that there's another uh, party that is not that is not in the government is monitoring the process to ensure that there won't be more corruption within that. Uh, so uh, those are some of the uh, challenges and another thing is uh, uh, victim compensation. Uh, it is also important that uh, we have a mechanism to see uh, how we are going to distribute these stolen assets back to its rightful owners. There should be a mechanism, how are you going to value that. So these things uh, are things that need to be uh, decided, pre these things need to be pre-planned uh, before uh, a country goes and, uh, uh, you know, try to recover assets. So all these things can be included in the law. The law can, uh, dis uh, like, uh, draft, and uh, law can uh, include what uh, what uh, method? What methods and what uh, uh, action should be taken when it comes to uh, uh, when it comes to beginning the process of asset recovery? And the last uh, challenge I want to mention here is the lack of consultation. The government needs to uh, get consultation from the public and civil society because it's uh, because the ex uh, knowledge and the expertise some of the local experts can bring would be very valuable for this process. Sulakshi, so looking ahead, what are some of the key priorities that Sri Lanka should focus on uh, to recover from the crisis and enhance governance to um, ultimately serve the people? Yeah, um, so one is uh, there should be transparency in beneficial ownership. Um, currently, uh, if you take companies, uh, like when you talk about asset recovery, uh, even, not even politicians are involved in it as installing, in stealing assets. Even uh, big companies, even big magnates get involved in this, uh, uh, in this crime. So it's important that uh, there is an online system where uh, public can access uh, which, uh, who are the beneficial owners of which companies. Uh, because uh, now currently um, the companies are required to give this uh, list of beneficial owners to the company registrar, but and the registrar, the company registrar has have this uh, has in this information, but it's not open to the public. So that uh, that is very important uh, thing uh, to uh, open up to the general public. And the other thing is we need to have a 
particularly exposed persons database. Uh, this is uh, this because uh, in Sri Lanka we currently do not have this database uh, for financial institutions who are the ones who will uh, who who are the ones who will have to deal with when the when their clients uh, loan the money through their banks. They are the ones who will have to coordinate with the uh, law enforcement agencies. So it's uh, before the before the crime happens, it's better to prevent it. So having a politically exposed uh, persons database would help financial institutions to uh, detect potential persons who may engage in money laundering. They can, uh, and that would help them to see whether someone uh, related to them have uh, laundered money or have been engaged in corruption before. So this is a very important tool that should be available uh, to the financial institutions. And the other uh, thing is we need to have a asset uh, declaration system. So in the past, it, uh, it, it was a requirement for the government to disclose asset declarations of politicians. But now under the Anti-New Anti-Corruption uh, Anti Act, the Bribery Commission is required to disclose this uh, asset declaration to the general public. And uh, it's important that the commission uh, implements the electronics, uh, the centralized electronic system to make these asset declarations public so the, so the people can see how transparent politicians are about their assets. And that would also help as a recovery uh, cases for these uh, government institutions, right? And, but not only that, not, these reforms, are, the reforms alone aren't sufficient. Right? Even the government institutions and law enforcement should proactively prosecute grand corruption cases in Sri Lanka. They shouldn't be waiting for another party or another organization to come and make a complaint. They should actively do that and uh, prosecute these white collar criminals. Right? And because then only you can, and, uh, you can have a good governance system. Uh, and uh, then only you can establish uh, a transparent, accountable system which, uh, uh, which, would, which would help the country to get out of this crisis as well. All right. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Sulakshi Madhavala, for joining in the conversation. Thank you for watching us. Good night.